This series from The Conversation is supported by the National Centre for Social Research, NATSEN, the largest independent and not-for-profit social research organisation in the UK. I've grown up in uh, what I would call sort of a traditional low-middle-class seaside town. Dan Evans grew up in Porthcawl, a small town halfway between Cardiff and Swansea in Wales. In his book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, he describes it as posh, an oasis within a solidly working-class post-industrial region. And like a lot of people in my town, and I'm sort of a product of social mobility. You know, my family is a product of social mobility, particularly on my father's side. My dad is a, a builder. He then became a teacher. His mum was firmly middle class. She came from a family of school teachers. But while his mum's family all went to university, on his dad's side, his granddad didn't finish school. He was a miner and steel worker. When we were in school, I basically hung around with my friends from my sort of street, you know, your friends from primary school, things like that. But things started to change in his teens. You gradually start to be sort of split apart from your friends and segregated in school on the basis of ostensibly academic ability. And then before you know it, without even making a conscious choice to be on this particular path, you are sort of being told, stay on for sixth form. Don't leave school and do an apprenticeship like your friends. Stay on for sixth form. Then you sort of encourage to go to university. Then you end up in university. The expectation was, and this is stated explicitly to you in school obviously is that if you go to university you're going to have a better life you know that's what's repeatedly told to you not just by your relatives and sort of friends dads things like that but by your teachers you know you want to stay in university and basically you're going to have this sort of professional class life and and your life will be better and all the sort of sacrifices you make in school like not staying out late going in to do your homework being a bit studious being a bit nerdy it's meant to pay off later in life But after graduating, Dan got stuck in a cycle of what he calls low-paid service work interspersed with stints in academia. He moved back and forth between Porthcawl and Cardiff. And what happened to me was I'm returning to my small town working in the bar that I worked in when I was growing up. And I'm bumping into all my friends from school who are like, what are you doing here? They'd say, aren't you a doctor or something? And I'd say, well, yes, you know, I am a you know, a doctor in sociology, you know, just sort of, there's just like this, <laughs> it's bad because it's like a pure object of pity and confusion, you know, like, well, you know, here's a man in his 30s with no house, no wife, <laughs> just a pathetic, quite a sad case. A lot of his primary school friends who had stayed put became successful self-employed tradesmen, police officers, salesmen. They were married, earned a nice amount of money and most owned their own house. These are anecdotes, but they speak to broader changes in the economy. You know, we've got a mass overproduction of white collar sort of graduates, whereas you've got a boom, for example, in construction. Tradesmen are like, I've got more work than they know what to do with. The guys who I'd grown up with and gone to school with were one side of the coin, and I was the other side of the coin. Both members of the same class, but sort of different different fractions based on our different experiences of social mobility. You describe social mobility as the great lie of our time. And is that because of this this illusion that a university degree will will get you where you need to be? And then it turns out it doesn't. Well, I do think it is a lie. Social mobility is a lie, I think. And the, this is being borne out empirically, you know, like with all statistics on sort of graduates, particularly working in non-graduate roles, the gradual decline of what's called the graduate premium, you know, the idea that over a lifetime graduates will earn more, that's increasingly like not the case. And having said that, you know, I bought into this myth massively. I can understand a lot of it and the impetus, particularly in certain working class communities, because if you think back to where I live, South Wales, where the mining industry was so dominant, there's a sort of constant trope in like literature and you can still find enough people who will have been told this themselves by their parents that mining was sort of had this paradoxical effect where people sort of missed the communities and the camaraderie and work but a lot of the people who did it were quite fixated on the idea that I don't want my child to have to do such a backbreaking difficult job so I can see where the sort of initial 
drive the social mobility and like the need for the sun to do like white collar work comes from because it is a it was extremely dangerous work who wouldn't want their child to have a better life Dan is now a lecturer of criminology sociology and social policy at Swansea University does that mean he's middle class based on his occupation or education level or is he working class based on his income level what is class nowadays? How do we define or measure it? And how does our changing class identity interact with identity politics? I'm Laura Hood, Senior Politics Editor at The Conversation UK. Welcome to episode three of Know Your Place, What Happened to Class in British Politics. What kicked off my interest in the changing nature of class was a set of findings in the 40th edition of British Social Attitudes. This is a large-scale annual survey of British households, covering everything from views on same-sex marriage to race and religion. It's run by the National Centre for Social Research, or NATSEN. Class was an interesting topic to look at because it's one that is kind of assumed not to matter so much. That's Oliver Heath, Professor of Politics and Co-Director of the Democracy and Election Centre at Royal Holloway, University of London. He wrote up the findings about class for the British Social Attitudes Survey in 2023. So there's you know, all this narrative about class dealignment, the decline of working class identity. We're all middle class, living in a classless society. So it was a good opportunity to use the data to see if that's something that resonates with the public and if they really have changed the way in which they think about class as much as is often presented. I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> I am middle class. <laughs> I know my place. <laughs> that is a clip from The Frost Report, a satirical TV show that first aired in 1966. But that was a long time ago, right? Life's different now. I asked NatSEN's Deputy Chief Executive, Gillian Pryor, how much British people are enjoying living in our purportedly post-class society. We find actually that 77% of people now say that social class affects a person's opportunities a great deal or quite a lot. And that actually has increased from 70% in 1983. So people are now perceiving more that class impacts on people's life opportunities than they did in the early 1980s. Uh, right. So despite how much has changed since the 1980s, despite our attitudes to race, sex and gender being unrecognisable, compared to 1983, we feel even more restricted by the class system than we did back then. Around the turn of the millennium, former Prime Minister Tony Blair and New Labour loved to claim that we're all middle class, but clearly the rest of us didn't get the memo. So our latest data show that 52% of people identify as working class compared with 43% who identify as middle class. Uh, right. So... More of us still see ourselves as working class than middle class. Despite all these changes in the structure of the labour market and sort of decline of industry and decline of manufacturing sector, people think about themselves in class terms almost exactly to the same degree as they were doing sort of 40 years ago. And there's been no decline in terms of whether people think of themselves as identifying with the class and no decline in whether they identify with being working class or not. So that seemed remarkably stable and, if anything, showed some signs of actually increasing. This would imply that our internal sense of class is out of step with external realities. I mean, the sources of class identity are really quite diverse. So we still see that link to the kind of occupation that people have, but we also see it linked to other things. So it's linked to education linked to uh, income, linked to the sort of part of the country that people live in and, and work in. The 2023 British Social Attitudes Survey found that ethnic minorities are more likely to identify as working class than white people. 
Young people are more likely to identify as working class than older people. And people living in the north of England are much more likely to see themselves as working class than people in the south. And then it's also linked to occupations of their parents. So what kind of class environment they grew up in. So there's that link with kind of class origins that then shapes people's identity, even if they perhaps go on to university and work in more middle class jobs. The whole my father was a toolmaker business. And when I went out into London to ask a few people about their class identity, that link to their background came up over and over again. One way... I'd say I grew up lower, but I identify more like middle or lower class, yeah. Or another. What class do you identify as? Working class. And can you tell us a bit more about why you feel that way? Um, Just my upbringing. Um, Yeah, mainly just my upbringing. Okay, wonderful. And this sense of our class as shaped by our past holds true for a lot of people. Gillian Pryor again. We find that people in the top 25% of household incomes, so okay, 47% of that group say that they're middle class, but then 32% of that group say they're working class. So, you know, that link with the sort of objective characteristics of, you know, how much money you have, what job you actually do, your education level is very... So even a third of the people who make the most money in this country see themselves as working class. That's crazy. But maybe all these different sources of identity do help explain why conservative politician Kemi Badenoch felt able to make this unexpected claim. I grew up in a middle class uh, family, but I became working class when I was 16 working in McDonald's. Badenoch is the child of a university professor and a GP. She went on to work in finance before becoming an MP and a government minister. And while it would be wrong to say that her life has been without hardship, few people have greeted her claim to working class identity with anything other than utter incredulity. She worked at McDonald's to earn money during her A-levels, And she talks about having to clean toilets, flip burgers, handle money. And I guess that seems to have made her feel working class, at least for a certain amount of time. If you enjoy Know Your Place, you might also like the We Society podcast from the Academy of Social Sciences. The new government faces pressing challenges on many fronts. Which policies could ease the housing crisis? How should society tackle hate crime? What can be done to support the growing number of child carers? Hosted by journalist and author Will Hutton, each episode of The We Society features leading social scientists and public figures sharing their big ideas for changing the way we live. With season seven being released later this autumn, why not catch up on this chart-topping podcast which has covered everything from AI to the climate crisis and heard from leading voices such as Hillary Clinton and Ai Weiwei. So if you want to hear research-led insights and solutions and great conversation, look up The We Society on Spotify, Apple and all podcast platforms. So to understand someone's class identity, it's clearly a lot more complex than just asking about their job. But what makes all of this even more complicated is that the occupational structure of the UK has changed quite a bit in recent decades. Dan Evans again. The size of the formerly self-employed has actually exploded is close to about 5 million, which is coming very close to the size of the entire public sector. And this is like absolutely unprecedented. You know, in the early 70s, there was about 1 million self-employed people. So I'm saying that's a, that's a massive change to the class structure. It's a really significant development. And Dan argues that has sprung a whole new class. Well, a kind of new class. The petty bourgeoisie, traditionally, you know, it's the idea of the small, self-employed individual throughout history. You know, the the artisan, shoemaker, thatcher, things like that. These small proprietors, these small artisans, they're distinct from the proletariat, the working class, because they own their own means of production. They own a small workshop and they're sort of distinct from the bourgeoisie because like the proletariat they have to sort of work to live so they've got this like liminal existence 
Karl Marx, father of class theory, believed that this petit bourgeoisie would disappear over time. But they haven't. Nowadays, there are two sides to this petit bourgeoisie class. The first one is the traditional one, the self-employed. And that would be the small self-employed, you know, the tradesman, bricky carpenter, sparkler, electrician, plumber, hairdressers, you know, personal trainers, gardeners. But the nature of self-employed work has changed just as much as any other career path in the past decade. A large proportion of the self-employed, and often the lowest earners among them, are working in the gig economy. 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 A significant proportion of new jobs created since 2005 have been in alternative work arrangements. Being either self-employed or working for someone else used to be a strong part of what differentiated one class from another. But this new way of working disrupts that. Is an Uber driver working class because they earn low wages or middle class because they own their means of production? So many people are sort of doing almost like bogus forms of self-employment. And whereas in the past, a lot of lots of people are doing this voluntarily, a lot of working class people aspired to join the ranks of the self-employed because they, they wanted to be their own boss. They didn't like being disciplined at work, sort of fantasised about going out on your own, things like that. Nowadays, more and more people are being forced, basically, into self-employment. Huge amounts of the self-employed are earning less than the employed. So increasingly, at like the bottom of the, the class, it's becoming like really, really vulnerable. Because of the precarity of the job market, more and more people are basically encouraged to think of themselves as de facto self-employed and to treat the job market as literally a job market and yourself as sort of a product. The gig economy, like the couriers, are often felt to be like the, the new face of the working class. Workers in the gig economy occupy a challenging middle ground. They are earning low wages and are essentially working in competition with each other, which makes collective organising difficult. They are told they are their own bosses, but in reality, their choices are limited by the algorithms allocating them work. Within this like ultra-marginalised strata of the population, the actual experience of work is actually quite similar to what it would have been for like the, the sort of self-employed artisan or whatever back in the day. Obviously, without the culture that came with it, they haven't got a guild culture, they're not like jealously preserving it and handing down being a delivery driver to your son or whatever like the butcher or candlestick maker or whatever would have done or the tanner would have done things like that the other side of the modern petit bourgeoisie is a whole new concept i mean i don't want to speak for you guys but is is like my class or our class they could be people working in the lower end of the public sector declassed academics people working in like i don't know the arts or possibly even the media, things like that. In the British class survey, they call it the emergent service worker, this highly educated person with high cultural capital, but not much money, basically. And they exist alongside the old petty bourgeoisie in 2024? Yes, they exist alongside them. You know, the, their life experience is probably very different. The, the new petty bourgeoisie tend to be geographically and socially mobile obviously the two things go together so to be socially upwardly mobile you go to university you leave your town then you go and live in a city to try to work in a particular industry whereas the old petty business you tend to be quite firmly rooted often because if you have a business don't want to leave your town what links the old and the new petty bourgeoisie is this strive for upward social mobility what split them off politically is that the old petty bourgeoisie have achieved a degree of social mobility through small business, through acquiring property, often under the right to buy, and they want to hold on to that. You know, their politics are often about sort of defence of their own position, whereas the new petty boosters have not achieved social mobility. You know, they've had it sort of blocked, and their politics tends to be politically progressive, i.e. the left. Ask me my three main priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education and education. New Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair saw education as the great equaliser. Get a degree and you'll become middle class if you weren't already. But he wasn't the only one to emphasise education. It's astonishing 
how we managed to bring inflation down, astonishing how we managed to reform public services, astonishing how we managed to change education and much else besides. John Major was one of the Prime Ministers to radically transform British higher education in the 1990s. The Conservatives massively expanded the number of universities in the country, and Blair, who followed Major, set a goal of getting 50% of young people into university. This changed approach to tertiary education policy has become a major contributor to the jumbling up of the British class system. And that's changed our politics too. So in terms of influences on voting behaviour, certainly the last two elections, possibly a little bit further back than that, age and education have been more important influences on how people vote than class defined in a kind of occupational income way. This is Paula Surridge. She's Professor of Political Sociology at the University of Bristol. The university population in the UK has exploded since the 1990s, and the experience of going to university has a profound effect on a person's outlook. Younger people tend to be more liberal than older people. John Curtis, Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde and Senior Research Fellow at Natsen, is also involved in the British Social Attitude Survey. Partly, perhaps, yes, people who go to university perhaps were already somewhat more socially liberal, but it also seems to be the case that the experience of university where people get mixed with people from diverse backgrounds, they're encouraged, particularly in the humanities, to be critically reflective about culture, etc., etc., that that seems to create a rather more socially liberal ambience. And certainly graduates, who, of course, also tended to have the labour market power to be using freedom of movement, they were on the pro-Remain side of the argument. The question is, will we be safer, stronger and better off working together in a reformed Europe or out on our own? In 2016, then Prime Minister David Cameron asked British voters to choose, leave or remain in the European Union. Remember Paula's assertion from episode one, so if we look at how demographics connect with Brexit vote, class is not the most important factor. Education is a stronger predictor of Brexit vote than class, with those with degree or higher level education more likely to vote remain than those with lower level qualifications. And the reason for that is the Brexit vote was primarily driven by a set of social values that don't relate to economics. So they are about things like attitudes to law and order, tolerance, um, those kinds of issues. And they very, very strongly predict Brexit voting. They are underpinned by education and people's class position tend to underpin the economic values. This is difficult to talk about. Paula and many other experts are talking about the education divide not as a value judgment, but as two distinct experiences of life. It's not that going to university is better than not going. It's simply different. But our social norms train our ear to hear this conversation a certain way. And there's a risk it's blocking our ability to have a proper debate about a force that is reshaping our politics. Yeah, so I think you do have to be really careful when talking about education. And, and I always try to be, although I had an experience just after the 2024 election where I posted something on Twitter, which to me was an entirely um, kind of neutral statement that the constituencies with the lowest proportions of degree educated people had all now got reform MPs. That was literally how I framed it. And I would never, ever frame degree versus not degree as smart versus not smart. I mean, the, the structural inequality in itself as to who goes to university and so on would undermine that argument so, so rapidly. I would never frame it like that. But I did get lots of reform voters, reform sympathetic people saying that I was insulting them. I'm like, but, but I'm not. I'm not. I didn't frame But they are had become so used to it being framed as an insult that that was how they responded to it. And, and I can absolutely understand why. And of course, in today's economy, you can be highly educated, middle class and poor. 
there's a well-known politician who appeals particularly strongly to this group. But what was even more inspiring was the number of young people who got involved for the very first time. That's Jeremy Corbyn, former leader of the Labour Party, being serenaded by the crowd at Glastonbury in 2017. During his leadership of the party, political engagement surged among people who were young and middle class, but often living on lower incomes. Membership of the party more than doubled to over 500,000 during his tenure. However, Corbyn's popularity among these left-wing activists did not translate into electoral success among the wider country. He did not win back the working-class vote. Here's John Curtis again. What Jeremy Corbyn managed to do by 2019 was to make the Labour vote the kind of vote that Tony Blair wanted to achieve for his party. That is that the Labour Party was now doing as well amongst middle-class voters as it was amongst working-class voters. Blair reckoned that's what Labour needed to do because of the changing occupational structure. It was Jeremy Corbyn who delivered on Tony Blair's objective, right? Not that either of them would ever wish to admit it. I accept the opposition of the billionaires because we will make those at the top pay their fair share of tax to help fund the world-class public services for you. That's real change. During the Corbyn years, you did see the Labour Party advocate policies that you know, survey research suggested would have been quite appealing to working-class voters. Tim Bale, Professor of Politics at Queen Mary University of London, has looked into the Corbyn phenomenon as part of his work on the British elections of 2017 and 2019. So more redistribution, more focus on, you know, core public services. The problem was that any of that was undermined partly by the failure of the Labour Party to project basic competence, but most of all by the fact that it was married to a much more liberal offer when it came to cultural matters. And so working class voters who might have gone for some of the things that Corbyn was offering them on the economic and public services front were completely put off by the the kind of socially liberal image that Corbyn and those around him projected. So in some ways, it was an opportunity missed. So they got it right on the economy and, and wrong on social issues. Yeah, I mean, right on the economy in the sense that some of the individual policies that the Corbyn um, Labour Party was offering, but unconvincing on the economy because there are almost too many of them. And, and certainly by the time of the 2019 election, it was a bit of a kind of Santa Claus manifesto, which nobody could believe. Yes, we all remember the broadband offer. <laughs> yes. I accept the implacable opposition of the private internet providers because we are going to give you the very fastest full fibre broadband for free. That is real change. But certainly on the, the kind of cultural front, it was just too socially liberal, I think, for most working class voters. But once again, I want to stress that we don't want to stereotype people too much. I mean, clearly, a lot of working class voters are exercised by immigration and some of them are exercised by you know, other cultural issues. But they're generally not obsessed with those issues uh, or at least as obsessed as some people on the right would like them to be. That's, let's talk about that a bit more. What, how should we be talking about this cultural question? Where did we get this idea that a working class voter is a culturally very conservative voter on a huge number of different issues? Well, I think the idea that working class voters are more culturally conservative is borne out by the survey research. But it's important not to see that there is a difference, if you like, in kind between working class and middle class voters it is a difference in degree. So in other words, you know, a lot of middle class people, for example, worry about immigration and want numbers to come down. That that can't be forgotten when we're talking about the fact that a lot of working class voters feel the same way. I think when it comes to attitudes to Europe, I think that probably was what 
led people to stereotype quite a lot of working class voters as kind of nationalistic, almost xenophobic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because you know the support for Brexit uh, among working class voters was higher than it was among middle class voters. But once again, you know, education has to come into that mix. So for middle class voters who were graduates you know, Remain was was the attractive option for them. But for middle class people who hadn't gone to university, they weren't so very different in their Euroscepticism from, you know, working class voters who hadn't been to university. So, you know, once again, we have this sort of um, confounder, which is education, <laughs> interfering, if you like, with, um, you know, our ability to say, well, working class people think this and middle class people think that. Turns out, People are complicated. I told Oliver Heath I was struggling to make sense of all of this. The objective reality of it is maybe not even as important as our own perception of our class, right? The, 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 the whole concept of class kind of relies on perception anyway. <laughs> so if we all perceive ourselves as being affected by our class, then that is the reality. Is that? Well, in some ways, yeah. I mean... I think class still has sort of objective consequences when you look at sort of like health outcomes or mobility or these kind of like economic indicators. They're still very real things that are attached to people's kind of like occupational class. But in terms of, say, politics and how people feel represented in politics and what kind of messages they respond to, their kind of identity and their class identity is probably the important thing because if a party is trying to appeal to the working class and you don't identify as a member of the working class, then you're probably not going to be so responsive to those messages. So when it comes to our political choices, our class identity is often what counts. But does the class identity of our politicians matter? This comes back a bit to one of the points about Starmer talking about his father being a toolmaker. And uh, the question is whether he will also govern like the son of a toolmaker. That's next time on Know Your Place from the Conversation Documentaries. This podcast was written by me, Laura Hood, and our producer, Anouk Mie. She also mixed the series. Our executive producer is Gemma Ware. If you'd like to get in touch, please email us at podcast at theconversation.com and do sign up for our Friday afternoon briefing, Politics Weekly, an essential analysis of the biggest stories in British politics to take you into the weekend. We'll drop a link in our show notes. This series is a production of The Conversation, a not-for-profit news organisation working with academics to share their knowledge with the general public. If you like what we do, please consider donating to The Conversation by going to donate.theconversation.com. Thank you again to the National Centre for Social Research for supporting this series. And thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, check out The Conversation Weekly. It's a show where leading experts around the world connect their research to the biggest trends, ideas and issues of today. I'm the host, Gemma Ware, and each week I get to talk to academics about the fascinating discoveries they're using to make sense of the world around us. We ask questions like, what's going on in our brains when we're in a state of creative flow? The most experienced musicians had a network of brain areas in the left hemisphere that was associated with a high state of flow. We find out what seals are telling us about the melting of Antarctic glaciers. We can get a vertical profile of the water property in every dive that they have. And we find out what happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa. Our expectations of what could have been done in the past are too high, but then our expectations of what we should be reimagining in the present for the future are too low. Follow The Conversation Weekly for new episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts, or find us on theconversation.com.